morning we have a question that is we're going to answer this how i'm planning to do this <clears throat> i'm going to answer this question and then i think i'm going to back up and let mary get back into leading prayer and then there will be a sunday or two or three she's gone here or there so if you have more questions i know this thing has kind of taken on a life of its own and i've gotten a lot of good input of we should keep doing this because Everybody's got questions, and there's never a time to talk about them. And I'm good with that, but probably not 100% of the time. Uh, so write your questions down, get them to me, and I'll keep them. And then the next time around when she's gone during a prayer time, I will uh, we'll talk questions and, and things like that. So that's good. The one we're dealing with this morning is very controversial. I would have never believed it in my lifetime had I not experienced it, and then after the experience, saw it in the Word. Um, it is not a salvation issue. See, to me, I, I try to divide things out into, is this going to affect my salvation, or is this something that is awesome knowledge, I want to know, but whether I know, don't know, whether I believe it or don't believe it, I'm still saved, I'm still going to heaven. So this is one of those in that side. This is things that people wonder about, and it's like, huh, I wonder, you know. And there's a whole bunch of those kind of things. But they have nothing to do, whether we believe it or don't believe it, has nothing to do with whether we're going to heaven or not. So kind of receive it that way. It's not a hill worth dying for. For the average person, it's just, it's, it's not. The average person's probably not going to get in the situation I had gotten in that precipitated all this. So, you know, take it as it is, and you're more than welcome to disagree. And if you do disagree, I'm fine with that too. Like I said, before this happened, I'd have disagreed too. So it's like, and the question is, can fallen angels or demons be saved? And I would have flat out said no years ago. I just said, no, I think they're done. Their goose is cooked, so to speak. Um, but then I had an experience, and then the experience said, well, if this was a genuine experience, then I got to go to the Word and find it. And lo and behold, I went to the Word and found it. There was a few of us, because there was, there was uh, three, four of us in this experience. So we went digging and found some things. Um, so, <clears throat> can they be saved? Can they not be saved? We know Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet will never be offered salvation because it specifically says in the book of Revelation, they will be in the lake of fire forever. So there is that, that's already prophesied where they're going. It's already prophesied from God prophesied it, not a man. God prophesied it. So that will never change. So if people say, can Satan be saved? No, he cannot. Not to fulfill that prophecy, and I'm, I'm a very strong believer in the inerrancy of the word. So if the word says this is the way it's going to go, then that's the way it's going to go. Um, I would, knowing my father, I would presume some form of restitution or reconciliation or let's fix this thing was offered to him before our time began, probably multiple times, because that's the character of the Father. He doesn't just go, oh, you messed up, poo, we're done with you. He, that's not how he operates, or none of us would be sitting here. He just works with us and works with us, and there comes a point, like the Scripture says, if you just keep hardening your heart, suddenly you'll be cut off. And that without remedy. There, there's no going back and fixing it. There, there comes a point where God says, okay, we played the game long enough. It's over. And then we can, we can moan and groan and whine and squeal and nothing's going to change it. You're, you're sitting in a new area too. This must have been a conspiracy. <laughs> a lot of people are shuffling around and messing with me. <laughs> Thank you, Molly, Kim. <laughs> um, anyway, so let's talk about the question. So what, what caused me to get in the situation where I even entertained this as a possibility? 
I was in, and for whatever reason, this is the way it worked for me. Thank God it doesn't work this way much anymore. It's, it's rare now. But when I started in ministry and ended up in some deliverance things, it seems like every demon was talking to me. And I couldn't get them to shut up. You know, they, they come up in a person, and, you know, you start praying over someone to cast something out, and boom, here's a demon talking to you like it's the person. And I don't want to talk to you. Get out of my face. And there was a chunk of time where it was just normal. It just was like, well, that's what's going to happen, so we got to deal with it. And, and we're going to be quoting a bunch of scripture to them and shutting them down because they're going to be lying and trying to kick in fear and tell me why they have right to be there and on and on and on, giving their story. I don't want to hear their story. But there was a period of time, that's how it just, I, it was an educating of me, I guess, maybe where God was coming from, why he was allowing it. Um, but that eventually quit, thank God. Because <laughs> it becomes this big, long, drawn-out process because they're always interfering with the person because they'll block the person out. They will, look at it this way. Let me try to explain this. This is a temple that has a physical brain as the interface for the spirit realm and the physical realm. The heart doesn't interface directly. You know, they're finding research it affects the brain. But my leg, my heart, my hand, these are not the interfaces. You can cut my hand off, and I still have interface as a spirit living in this temple. I still have the ability to use this temple, talk out this temple, and so forth. There's one organ you can't lose. If you lose that organ, you no longer have the ability to interact with this earth. It's the brain. So I am a spirit. I have access to the brain so I can access the physical realm in my body. The Holy Spirit lives in this temple with me. He is a spirit. And probably not as much as he should have, but he has access to my brain too. Uh, and he tries to get into my thoughts and, and direct and lead and guide that way also. Demonic spirits, if they can get into a person's temple, if God allows them, they can access their brain too. It, it's, it's like sitting in the driver's seat of a car. Depending upon who's in the car, You've got a potential of numerous people sitting in the driver's seat and driving that thing. That's kind of what this body is. It's a, a bioelectrical chemical machine that, depending upon who's sitting in the driver's seat, is going to drive this thing. Preferably, we stay in the driver's seat all the time, and the Holy Spirit comes, helps us. Yep. That's the way it's supposed to work. However, when people have uh, more emphatic or severe demonic problems, the demonic can get into the driver's seat because the, the thing that gives them the right is either the generational or the personal sin that the person's been involved in. The, the, the more severe that is or the more of it, it gives them access to the driver's seat and to that physical brain. And <clears throat> once, once you've... Once you've seen it, it's amazing how many people you talk to <clears throat> or you, you know, whatever, have encounters with, especially if they get angry or, or don't want to do something. Once you've seen it in the eyes, you can just, you can see it that fast. It's no longer the person looking out the eye gate at you. There's something else looking out at you. And it's like, well that demon may not be necessarily speaking directly through him, but it's looking at me. It's not happy, and it's probably giving them the thoughts of what they should say because what they're saying is not good. Follow me? That happens a lot. But the whole thing of, of a person being taken over and literally they come back a half an hour later and it's like, what happened? I have no memory of the last chunk of time. How did I get to this room? How did I change chairs? What happened? That's more rare. That used to happen to me a lot, to where trying to get somebody free of something, and here we go, back into the zoo. It's going to be a roller coaster now for a while. It's like, it's, it's, that's what it feels like. It's, man, it's just like, 
oh, this really stinks. Um, <laughs> to begin with, it, you know, people will say, well, wasn't that exciting? <clears throat> it's like work. When you get a new job, oh, it's going to be great, it's gonna, but eventually it becomes work, and you don't want to go anymore, no matter how good a job you got. Well, that's kind of how this ends up. It's like, yeah, to begin with, it's like, wow, this is really, I never thought of that. I don't know. Then after a while, the continual lying and deception and accusations and all the stuff that pours out of that kingdom, you just get tired of hearing. It's the same old, same old. And just shut up now. I, I know I win, so quit trying to fight. I, I, I know who wins here. You're just prolonging your misery, and you're making me miserable, which that's probably part of it. But uh, so anyway, there was this one situation where I was dealing with someone, and uh, again, it was a, a demonic thing going on, and it had the, the thing had manifested previously, and they weren't free yet, so I was praying with them again. And as I'm praying with them, this demon comes up and starts talking to me, only this one was different. This thing came up, and the first thing it said is, can you help me? And I'm, you know, the first thing that goes through my mind is, wow, now they're taking a whole new route. You know, what kind of deception is this going to be? Um, so I said, well, what do you mean? I want to get back to the Father, and I don't know how. Well. And my, my, my brain's still going, oh, what kind of deception is this now? But it's a legitimate question that in my gut felt like a legitimate question. I thought, well, this, this is odd. So I just gave the answer I had. You can't. Demons can't get saved. Or fallen angels or which, whichever variety you are. You can't. It's not possible. It looked at me and asked, Two questions. It said, so the Father is not capable of forgiving me? You mean the Father doesn't want to forgive me? Well, see, now, I can't speak for the Father, but neither one of those questions, if I give the answer that I think I should give, neither one of those questions, that's a bad answer. The Father's not capable Yep, you got it right. He's not capable of forgiving you. See, that, that somehow doesn't fit right. Because he's the father. He might be able to do a whole lot more than we think. Okay? The father doesn't want to forgive me. Well, see, now that's a bad question, too, to say, yeah, he, he's done with you. He doesn't want nothing to do with you. First of all, I don't know that. Second of all, that's not the father I know. See, it's, it's not his character. So I'm backed in a corner with two questions that are very legitimate. If this was a human being asking, I might say, oh, yeah, absolutely. Let me pray with you. And, da, 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 and you can get saved. And this, and the other. But I got a, a, a spirit talking to me. So I sat there and pondered for a bit going, trying to figure out the, the angle. What's the angle they're trying to play? They're trying to play an angle. What's the angle? Finally, I thought, well, the best way to do this, let's just call their bluff. I said, I don't think this is going to work. As far as I'm concerned, you're lost. You can never get saved. You can't ever get back to the Father. But I'm not him, and I'm not going to talk for him. So I'll pray with you. But like I said, I think we're wasting our time. <laughs> and that's how I went into it. So I said, repeat after me, just like I would with a human being. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I can't say that name. I said, well, you're going to have to say that name. That's the name that, that's salvation name right there. You bypass that name, yeah, you are in trouble. Well, I can't say that name. I said, well, you're going to have to. So I said, dear Jesus, you say it. Had, it finally got it out. Had the most difficult time. It's like it was an excruciating pain to say that name. And I'm going... Now, this is starting to look real to me, because usually when you cast them out, when you use the name of Jesus, you can tell it puts them in pain. They don't like that name. Um, so then I went further, and I remember the other phrase that it had a lot of problems saying is, uh, talked about the Father, and 
coming back to the Father. So we come through the blood of Jesus. It stopped right there and said, I cannot say that word. I said, you have to say that word. Because see, this is, now I'm taking it on as a, you're trying to play me. So now I'm going to call your bluff. You don't want to say the blood? Well, I'm going to make you say the blood. Even I probably could have bypassed it somehow, but I thought, this is good. Let's go with this. <laughs> you know? Um, so, nope, you're going to have to say it. Well, it finally spit it out in, in lots, what, what perceived as lots of agony from my perception. Could have been a game, could have been trying to trick me, whatever, but it perceived so. So spit that out, and then I close the prayer down, so I ask you to forgive me. I want to come back. So it said that, and it had its head down, had the person's head down. It's speaking through it like a person, but you know, it had the person's head down. And everything went quiet. And I thought, well, let's see where this goes, because I'm sure this isn't going to work. And it probably took 15, 20 seconds. And it lifted the person's head, tears rolling down its face. And it said, tell, name the person, tell so-and-so, I am so sorry for everything I did to them. I was wrong. And I wanted to ask a question, because now I'm shocked. <laughs> and it said, can't talk to you. The Father's calling me. Boop, and it was gone. I'm going, okay, that's hard on theology. <laughs> it's like, what do I do with that? So at that time, I was still being mentored by a guy who had done this for years. So once I got done with this session, then the person was back. So then when I got done with this session, I called him. I said, feel free to tell me I'm cuckoo. But here's what just happened. And I walked him through the whole thing like I just did you. And it was dead quiet on the other end because he was probably trying to figure out, what is this? Dead quiet. And when he started talking, he said, yeah, I've had that happen a few times too. I said, is that real? Or is this all a big deception? He said, I'm not sure. He said, but... I was like you. He said, when something asks for salvation, I don't have the right to tell it no. He said, so I've done the same thing, gotten the same response. He said, I think it's real. I said, well, if it's real, it's got to be in the Word. He said, exactly. He said, but I'm not finding much. He said, so let me know if you find something. <laughs> said, I will. So there was, there was more of us in this session uh, so we went, that was our assignment. We got to find this in the Word. And I didn't find the first verse. The first verse here, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, and I'll read all these out of the New King James. Um, I didn't find this first verse. It was one of the guys who was with me. He came, I think it was the following Sunday, he came and said, I found a verse I think talks about this. I said, really? So he took me here. And uh, so let's, let's look at, this will be the jump off point, because it was the jump off point then. It says, um, <clears throat> if you back up, it's talking about us getting saved, being predestined to be adopted as sons to the praise and the glory of his grace, verse 5, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made abound to us, verse 8, verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, which was the salvation of the human race. So that he's talking about getting saved and everything involved with that. Verse 10, and that's his purpose. It's the mystery was his purpose. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might... I looked up there and lost my place. Let me go back here. Dispensation, fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Okay, so I understand him gathering the things which are on earth in Christ, gathering them together. But who in the world in heaven? And which heaven is he talking about? 
Is this first heaven? Is this second heaven? Is this third heaven? I'm not sure. Which is he talking about? But there's something here that he's going to gather together in salvation, in Christ, the ones that are in heaven. And it's like, I told him, I said, you might have a point. I've never seen it that way before. That's an interesting thought. Let's keep digging. So we, the next one we ran across was Ephesians 3. And the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, uh, the, those four, I named three of them, but those four, uh, he, Paul kind of repeats himself some in each of them or enlarges in a different one. But let's go to Ephesians first. Ephesians 3.10. Again, let's start at verse 8 because that's where the thought starts. Paul saying to me, I'm less than the least of all the saints. This grace was given to me that I should preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of this mystery. So he's still talking about the mystery of salvation and what God had planned which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ Jesus. So he's, he's you know, if you go up to verse 7, it says the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body. And this, is the, this was the message Paul was given, the message of faith and salvation, but it's the message that the Jews hated and why they were always trying to kill him. Because it's like, no, the Jews have salvation, nobody else does. And Paul keeps saying, no, God has given salvation to the Gentiles too. So in that thought of, okay, we're talking salvation, who it's for, and this is the mystery, God wants, the, God wants everybody saved, verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. So the church is supposed to show this whole salvation mystery to the world so everybody can get saved. But it doesn't say that. That's what religion says, or my, ta my teaching taught me. It says might be known to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So now verse chapter 1 verse 10 said he wants to gather everything back together in Christ and the part that threw me was the things in heaven. Well what in heaven needs saving? Good question. Till you read Ephesians chapter 6, and he tells you <laughs> uh, principalities and powers in heavenly places. Okay, Chapter 3, verse 10, he said, now let me show you a little bit more of this mystery and what God's intention was. His intention, jump back to verse 10 if you would on the screen there. His intention was that this wisdom, that he's bringing everything back through Christ, might be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers in heavenly places. Well, see, now that, like, what? Why would he dangle the church like a carrot in front of principalities and powers saying, look at my wisdom. Through Jesus, I've forgiven them. I've saved them. They're going to spend eternity with me. I want you to see what I've done. Na 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 You can't have it. That's not his character. He doesn't do that. Love wouldn't do that. It would just be pouring salt in the wound kind of thing, tormenting him. So I'm going, well, why in the world? And see, this to me, now that I've kind of put the pieces together, at the time it made no sense, but now it makes a lot of sense. So now that I'm looking at it, let me just point it out. And I've said this before. The thing we have to remember is as the church, as born-again believers, we are always being watched, always, whether by human beings or by them. We're always being watched. So I don't care if anybody physically is, is seeing you do whatever you want to do that is sinful or not. There's a whole host of beings watching you. you say, well, why would they be watching me? Because that was God's design that as they watch you, they see salvation in action. There's what it said. That through the church, his intent was through the church. He's going to show the heavenly realms. Everything can be gathered together in Christ. Huh. Well, isn't that interesting? 
So since the, they kind of go together, you've got Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians is the next place we'll go. He goes into it a little deeper in Colossians. In fact, by the time you see this, you're going to say, I have never seen that that way before, but right there it says it. That's what I said too. Um, <clears throat> oh, start at verse 9. We're going to, the main verses we're after a little deeper in, but start at verse 9 so we get the context. Um, he's talking about people getting saved, their faith in Christ. Verse 3, we thank God, always praying for you since we heard of your faith in Christ. So he's talking to people that got saved. Verse 9, uh, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard of it, heard of what? You got saved. Do not cease to pray for you, and we ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. So he's talking about him get, being saved and now growing in that salvation. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Giving thanks to the Father, and he goes on and talks about that. Verse 13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So he's absolutely talking salvation and spiritual or, or, or soul growth. I shouldn't use the word spiritual, but growing as a Christian. Notice verse 14. We'll jump in and start there. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Okay, so let's stop and talk about that just a little bit. Firstborn does not mean Jesus didn't exist before Mary. And he was born. And see, he was the firstborn of Christians, and that's where uh, certain denominations go in the ditch and say, well, he can't be God because he was born like the rest of us, and he's just the first one of us, and blah, 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 blah. No, not what it's talking about. John 1 makes it very plain Jesus existed forever. Yep. Amen. Yep. Okay? So firstborn, firstborn, don't think just physical. Remember, we're a spirit, soul, and a body. Yep. And you will never understand the word fully until you you look at scripture from what is it talking about spirit soul or body Amen. so you've got the firstborn over all creation well physically that makes no sense at all because he wasn't born before i mean it, it makes no sense you can't plug that in physically but you can plug it in spiritually and it makes perfect sense what was the, who was the first one to, to have eternal life coming back from the dead? Jesus. He was the firstborn from the dead. Spiritually, he came back from hell to eternal life. And then they throw in, Paul throws in over all creation. Why did he say all creation? Why he, He's the firstborn. So if Jesus is the example of you can have life after death, because we know he existed before that, came to this earth, did his thing, died, went to hell for us, substituted for us, and then was raised back out, born back out of that. That's how I understand it. Nothing else makes sense to me. This is an example for all creation. Well, Again, you're, hangling a, you're dangling a carrot out in front of somebody here that's like, really? Well, read on. For by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. So we're talking spirit realm now. Which, it's like, well, yeah, I could see that Jesus created the spirit realm. I mean, somebody had to create him. Okay. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, both sides have that. We know that from what Paul said in Ephesians 6. The demonic side has thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers also. All things were created through him and for him. Okay. 
And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So all of his creation still exists because he exists. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn from the dead, that goes back to that verse we were just talking about. Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. Firstborn from what? Firstborn from the dead. That in all things he might have preeminence. So let me read that to you. Can you switch to the Amplified with me? Let me read that to you out of the Amplified, verse 15 forward. And all the Amplified does is it takes some of those original words and gives the Greek meaning to it, just kind of enlarges it. Verse 15, uh, 14, in, him, in whom we have redemption through his blood, which means the forgiveness of our sins. Verse 15, he is the exact likeness of the unseen God. Jesus is the invisible representation of the visible representation of the invisible. He is the firstborn of all creation. Now we know what that means from the dead. Last verse gave us that. For it was him that all things, it was in him that all things were created in heaven and on earth, things seen and things unseen, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. All things were created and exist through him by his service, his intervention, and in him and for him. And he himself existed before all things. So it's not like he started with Mary. He has always existed. That's how things got created. And in him all things consist, or he holds them all together. He is also the head of the body, the church, seeing he's the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead, so that he alone in everything and in every respect might occupy the chief place, stand first, and be preeminent. For it has pleased the Father, hang on to your seats now, so we got, the running, we got the running start. It has pleased the Father that all the divine fullness, the sum of the divine perfection, powers, and attributes, should dwell in Christ permanently. And God, verse 20, purposed that through, by the service, the intervention of Jesus, him, the Son, all things should be completely reconciled back to himself. That was God's intent. Yep. Amen. That's good. Holy moly. And I say that in a positive way. Everything, his intent, his purpose was through Jesus to reconcile everything back to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, as through him the Father made peace by means of the blood of his cross. I would not think it means demonic except for the verses preceding where he specifically listed them. So now I'm going, well, that one's pretty plain. That was his intent. So if you're going to ask the question, can they... Well, if that was his intent, I would presume now they can. So I would see it. Why would he say that if they can't? In fact, that was his intent from the beginning. So one more scripture, 1 John chapter 2. <clears throat> We're running out of time. 1 John 2, verse 2. I'll read that in the Amplified since I'm in that already. And he, the same Jesus himself, is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours alone, but for the sins of the whole world. Why didn't it say the sins of all humans? The sins of the sons of Adam. The, the, whatever. Nope, there it is again. Going with the thought Jesus said. You've got to preach the gospel to all creation. And it's like, really? So I had to wrestle with those scriptures for a while because it, that threw my theology in the ditch because I thought I had it all figured out and that was not part of it. And then all of a sudden it's like, I've read this book how many times? And I've never seen that. Because we interpret it according to what we believe rather than read it and interpret it according to what it says. 
And then when you're pushed in a corner and all, all of a sudden your beliefs are shaken, now all of a sudden you're looking at it like, oh, well, let's see what it really says. Well, it said it the whole time. Just I never saw it because I didn't believe it. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, now eventually somebody's going to go to Hebrews 1, I believe it is, and say it was not for uh, uh, angels that Jesus came and sacrificed. He says that there, but it was for human beings. So how does that fit in? Because I had that given to me, and it's like, well, I know what this says. So somehow we got to see how this fits. So in this, this, this is how I see it, because I'm running out of time. i got to go straight to the, the point. This is how I see it. In this dispensation time, the rulership of this realm, the world, this realm, has been given to us. In fact, God told Adam and Eve, everything on earth is under you. Rule it. Reign it. Okay? That includes the demonic realm that was here, and Satan, that was, he was here when God said that to Adam and Eve. Now, they didn't know what God was talking about, but God knew what he was talking about. You're over it all. You're going to rule it all. It's like, okay. So somehow they answer to us. Which goes to Paul's thought in 1 Corinthians 6 or 7. I could find it. Uh, let me give you the exact verse. I think I have it written here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 3. Goes to Paul's thought of why can't you judge issues in the church? I mean, this isn't that hard. He said, don't you realize that you're going to judge angels? and pronounce opinion between right and wrong for them. What? Well, we're definitely not going to judge the angels who haven't fallen. What right do we have to judge them? They're not going to be judged for anything. And if they are, it's between them and God. But, I mean, they're still perfect. Why would they need judging at all? So what angels are he talking about? He's got to be talking about fallen angels. And that the judgment of fallen angels has been given to the human being, specifically the church. Which goes back to Ephesians 3. They're watching the church. So here is my, <clears throat> here's where I'm at now. New revelation may throw me in the ditch and I've got to go someplace else, but here's where I'm at now. <clears throat> um, since they're under us, we're supposed to be ruling them. We have the authority as the church to show them what salvation looks like and what God is capable of doing. That's why God set it up that way. Now, I don't, I don't know the whole story behind the scenes, but God intentionally set it up that the fallen angels, the demons, would watch us to see what salvation works like. And depending upon what they do with that, you and I eventually are going to judge them, like Jesus is judging the church. Somehow we're going to judge them. I don't know what it all entails. I don't know of any other place it talks about it, just there. So Paul knew something he hinted at, but he didn't go deep into it. But we're going to judge them. Is it possible, and I'll just leave this question, and praise Ben if you want to come get ready. Uh, is it possible that what we have freely received, God designed that they can receive what we received through us because they're under us. Mm. Whose sins you retain will be retained. Whose sins you remit will be remitted. He gave us that power. Amen. Yeah. So there's some kind of possibility there. That doesn't apply, as far as I know, just to humans, but goes further. So I say that to say this. Here's my conclusion to the whole matter. Do I think they can be forgiven? Scripturally, yes. I mean, you saw scriptures there that, I mean, the Colossians one just flat out says it. Uh, do I think they can be forgiven? Yes. Do I understand it all? No. But I do understand a little bit 
of what my father's like. And to answer the two questions, do you mean to tell me the father can't forgive me? No, the father can because we just saw Jesus paid for it. You mean to tell me the Father does not want to forgive me? He won't? Yeah, that's not my Father. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's my Father. So I've got to come down on the side of, you know, this Jesus might have done more than we gave him credit for. <laughs> he might have included everything just like the Scripture says to be able to be reconciled back to the Father, except for the three. The three are doomed. We know that for a fact. But true victory, Jesus might have done a whole lot more than the church thought he did. And I would be the last one to argue with God when we get there and say they have no right to be here. They shouldn't have been forgiven. That's not love. If God thinks it's okay for them to be forgiven, we need to too. So there you go. So let me just say this, since we've got two minutes left, and then I'll, since you're right in front of me, I'll give you one thought. Um, I'm going to get Mary back in line to, to be doing prayer again. That's my, my goal. If you have more questions, there's going to be Sunday she's gone. Please text them to me, write them out, get them to me somehow. And then on those Sundays, we can do this kind of thing and answer questions because I've had so many people saying we should do this all the time because it answers questions and I want to ask questions and I got lots of questions and okay, we'll fit it in. But we still want to get this thing back more to prayer emphasis. So I'm going to ask Mary to get back in the saddle next Sunday. But if you have questions, we're not just done now. Uh, we will continue this. What's your thought? I was just going to add one more scripture. One more scripture. That you were talking about in Romans 8. It talks about all of creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed so that they will be freed from their bondage of decay. Okay. So, I'll say it again so the online people can hear it. In Romans 8, it says all of creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed, all of creation, so that they can be freed from their bondage and decay. So there's another one that makes you go, hmm, I wonder how deep God wanted to go with that. Well, maybe it's true all things are possible. <laughs> you know, we say it, but when you get talking about this kind of stuff, it's like, I wonder if that's possible. Well, Jesus said maybe it is possible. Real quick. Ooh, I'm going to put that in the list. Lamentations 3.31. For no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Ooh, that's a good one. With that, I'm done.